to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ you believe there is one god you do well even the demons believe and tremble james chapter 2 verse number 19. welcome to our study of demons in this series of lessons entitled a special study series we're going to be looking at a host of different subjects that are maybe rather unique ones that we don't hear as much about maybe even ones that we are curious about what does the bible say on this very unique subject as always our programs are being brought to you by members of the church of christ We'd love for you to stop by and visit the Church of Christ in your area. If you'd like to know more about the Lord's Church and God's plan of salvation, please visit the local church of the Lord, Church of Christ, in your area. And if you'd like to have a copy of this series of lessons or any of our lessons, you can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a host of Bible study material that is available to you free of charge. And if you'd like to have a copy in your home to watch on DVD or listen to on CD, you can visit our website as well, and we'll provide a free copy of that for your own personal Bible study. Today we think about a very unique study, a very special study in many ways, and it deals with a study of demons. What do you know about demons? We read about them in both the Old and the New Testament. Do they exist today? Do I need to live in fear of, of demon possession today or, or some demon taking control of my body? Were they real in the Bible? Are they real now? And what is the exact nature and purpose of demons in the Scripture? Well, we know that from Hollywood to our publishing houses today, demons have become very popular, especially on the movie scene. There's a host of movies that have been written about demons and demon possession. Maybe you can remember and envision in your mind the movie Poltergeist where the little girl is standing in front of the TV with a static and her hands on it and supposedly something's going to come out of the TV and possess her. Well, we think of movies like The Exorcist, where the whole idea is someone goes around and casts out demons out of these people and how they're possessed today. Maybe you've seen movies like Insidious or, or movies like The Conjuring that are all based on the ideas of demon possession. It is indeed a very popular subject and topic for Christians to think about today. In fact, among the Christian world, among the religious world, this idea of demon possession and exorcism has also become extremely popular. A multiplicity of books have been written about this subject. For example, some have written books entitled, How Christians Cast Out Demons Today, Demon Proofing Your Prayers, How to Cast Out Demons, or even one of these series of books, Exorcism, for dummies. And so what does the Bible really teach about demons and a study of those? Now, I know especially this has become popular because of Catholic ideas that certain priests or certain people can go around and, and the idea of exorcism, casting out demons, and maybe you've seen even documentaries about that. Well, let's not focus on what books say or what movies say or what some religious group may think let's turn our attention to the word of god what does the bible actually say about demons in scripture we find the word demon used about four times in the old testament in the book of leviticus chapter 17 Verse number 7, we find this reference to demons. The scripture says, They shall no more offer their sacrifices to demons 
after whom they've played the harlot, this should be a statute forever for them throughout their generations. And so what did God say about demons in the Old Testament? God said, no longer are my people going to offer sacrifices, give their children to, or worship demons. God had seen that happen and God said, I don't want you doing that anymore. Another passage, Deuteronomy chapter 32. Listen to what verse 17 says in the Old Testament. They sacrifice to demons, not to God. To gods they did not know, to new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. And so most of the references, you've got it mentioned in 2 Chronicles 11 verse 15, Psalm 106 verse 37, and the two passages that we referenced here, and God's people were playing the harlot. They were offering sacrifices, even sometimes their children, to what the Bible refers to as demons. Now, in the Old Testament, there's not a whole lot said about demons. It's only mentioned about four times in Scripture. But there's a stark contrast when you come to the New Testament. The New Testament has a lot to say about demons and demon possession. In fact, compared to the four references in the Old Testament, demons are mentioned at least 65 times in the New Testament. Now, here's what's even more unique about that. Of the 65 occurrences, 55 of those are in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What then do I learn from that fact? Here's what I learned. Demons, for the most part, were directly linked to the ministry and life of Jesus Christ. Why did demons exist? What was their purpose? Well, we know they're of Satan. We know that they know who God and Jesus is. And God allowed that to happen so that He could show the power of His Son, Jesus Christ, over Satan and the evil world. When Jesus would go around and cast out demons with just a word, did not that show His power over Satan and His workers in the first century? Well, if demons did exist, where did they come from? What's their origin? How did they come to exist? As we think about this idea, there have been various ideas throughout history. For example, in the writings of Enoch, a apocryphal writing after the first century, he believed that demons were fallen angels. Second Peter 2, 4, Jude verse 6 teaches that some angels left their proper domain and have been reserved in chains of darkness for the judgment day. Now, that's what Enoch believed, although we don't necessarily find that in Scripture. Josephus and many Greeks living believed they were spirits of evil men. In fact, Justin Martyr would go as far as to say they were the offspring of angels and men. Now, that's all man's idea. But in truth, all we know is that they are created beings under the control and power of God. They're not eternal. Like God, they are workers of Satan, and they are definitely under the authority, power, and control of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so that would be the limit of knowledge that we really have about demons and their origin in the Scripture. Anything more than that is simply conjecture on the subject. Let's then think about the nature of demons. What do I know about demons and their nature and how that related to people in the New Testament time? I know that demons possess the power of speech. In Mark chapter 5, and cases like Luke chapter 4, verses 33 through 37, and where the demoniac or where legion is, we definitely know they could speak. For when Jesus came to the man who had the legion, the host of demons in him, he said to him, what is your name? And the demon responds and says, we are legion is our name, for we are many. And so they had some ability to speak through the human host that they did find themselves in. What else do we know about the nature of demons? They had some type of cognitive ability, thinking, rationalizing ability 
to recognize and understand who Jesus was. Let me illustrate. Luke chapter 8, we think again of the demoniac and, and what went on in that context. And I want you to listen to what the demons say uh, to Jesus in this context. Luke chapter 8, notice verse number 28. The scripture records, When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. Multiple times we will see that the demons recognize Jesus, they, they know His power, and they are fearful of who He is, the very Son of God. And so they have some type of ability, cognitive ability, to think and rationalize and realize who the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is. What else do we know about demons? They had a faith, but it was a damning and destructive faith not a saving faith. Notice again James 2 verse 19. James says, You believe there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Demons had a, a faith, not a saving faith, not a, a biblical faith that's approved by God, but they had a demonic faith, a faith that just recognized the fact, a faith that was belief alone, and a faith that never acted out the way God wanted it to. And so they could believe, but belief alone didn't save them. Now, friend, I understand we're talking about demons, but I want to drive a point home here. A lot of folks will say, all you've got to do to be saved is believe in Jesus. Friend, according to James 2 verse 19, if that's true, all the demons in hell ought to be saved. What will faith alone, just believing, get you? It'll get you a front row seat in the halls of hell right next to all the demons. That's all it'll get you. If all I do is believe and I never live, follow, obey the teaching of Christ, all I've got is a demonic type of faith. What else do we know about the nature of demons? Demons had the ability in the New Testament to possess people. Uh, give me an example. Mark chapter 1, listen to what the Bible records in verse number 32 concerning the demon possession in this context. Jesus is casting out demons. It's something they've never seen. And verse 32 of Mark 1 records this. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to Jesus, or to Him, all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. Again, we learn from Mark 5, the example of Legion, where He had a, a host of demons possessing Him. And so, in some way, shape, or form, God gave them the power, and they were allowed to possess, but again, for the purpose of Jesus showing His power over demons and actually showing that through Christ, men and women can be free from Satan, his power, and his influence when Jesus comes into their life and makes contact with their spirits. As we think about the nature of demons, let's also realize that there are certain doctrines that are labeled as demonic. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, teaching deceiving doctrines, deceiving doctrines and doctrines of Demons, having to see me spirits and doctrines of demons. And so some doctrines the Bible likens as to demonic in their nature. That is, they are holy of Satan, they are evil, they're ungodly, they don't access the truth at all, and they will only result in people being lost. And so doctrines and teachings that do not bring Christ and His teaching to the front are only doctrines of Satan and his cohorts. Now, we know in the Bible that demons were very aggressive, actively trying to seek out people to possess. Demons weren't nonchalant and laid back and lackadaisical. The, the, in the, what we see in the Bible is they were very aggressive and active in trying to possess someone. For example, notice Matthew chapter 12, verse number 43. Listen to what the Scripture says about the aggressive nature of demons. The Bible says in verse 43, When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, 
He goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I'll return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. They enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. So it shall be with this wicked generation. Jesus is describing the aggressive nature of evil, sin, and wickedness, and he uses demons in this illustration. If they're cast out, they go looking and searching. And so in the New Testament, they were very aggressive in trying to find someone or something to possess. What else do we know about demons from the New Testament? Their nature is that when they did possess someone, it was defined in the Bible as torment. Luke chapter 6, verse number 18. I want you to listen to what the Scripture says about their possessing of individuals. Jesus is talking in verse 17. He came down with them, stood on a level place with a crowd of His disciples. Verse 17, a great multitude of people came from all Judea and Jerusalem, from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear Him and be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Now, let me give you an illustration of what, what the Bible defines as this type of torment. Again, we use the man known as Legion, the demoniac. What was his state when he was possessed by all those demons? You can't imagine more torment than this. He lived in the graves, the tombs, and the mountains. He ran around naked, according to Luke chapter 8. He often cut himself with sharp rocks and cried out, uh, no one could bind him with chains or shackles every time they tried. He would break the chains and shackles alone, living in the graveyard, harming himself, and could not be contained. Can you imagine more torment than that type of lifestyle? Another example of demons and their aggressive, tormenting nature, their evil, wicked nature, is a case found in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 19. Beginning in verse 13, we've got some Jewish, who they believe are exorcists, and they, these men try to cast out a demon. And they tried to do so using the Jesus of Paul or, or some other of the apostles, and so they implore them by that to come out. And do you remember what happened? The demon actually attacks them. They leave, that cast their clothes off. They're there naked and harms them. And so they even had the power to attack certain people in the first century. Well, let's now think about demon possession and what was really associated with that in the New Testament. When someone was demon possessed, he was completely possessed, the demons completely possessed that individual. I want you to listen to Luke chapter 4, verses 33 and 34. The Bible says, Now in the synagogue, there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Here this man's in the synagogue. The demon is overpowering him, and he addresses Jesus. And so you've got the complete possession of the individual at times by demons. Now, there are times in the Bible where sickness is also associated with demon possession. For example, the man who is described as a maniac in some ways in Matthew chapter 8 verse 28 was demon possessed. The one who had epilepsy and would, the demons would cast him into the fire and he would have seizures. Matthew 17, 15, something like unto epilepsy. The man who was mute in Matthew 9, verse 32, that was related in some ways to the demon possession that was in his body. But what's real interesting about demons, and this is something, again, that's even hard for us to understand, is a person could actually be possessed by more than one demon at once. Legion. We don't know the exact number, but the word legion is a Roman military group of anywhere from two to 3,000 people. They were cast out into 2,000 or cast out into a number, a multitude of pigs. And so here you've got an example of more than one. 
Mary Magdalene had seven demons at one time. Luke chapter 8, verse 2. Seven worse came back after the house was clean and that one left. In Luke chapter 11, verse number 26. Let's now realize this. And friend, this is really what I want you to think about. I want you to listen real carefully. We've talked a lot about demons, their nature, some of the things they did. But why did demons exist? Friend, let's realize that Jesus was the master of all demons and that His power was exhibited in a marvelous way over Satan and all the workers of evil as He cast out certain demons. Jesus indeed was the master exorcist. He cast out demons in various occasions in a multitude of various ways. For example, Jesus cast out demons with only a word. Matthew 8 verse 16. Uh, Matthew chapter 12 verse 28. Jesus cast them out by prayer. And so with a word, by praying, they were cast out as well. Jesus, even at one time, cast them into swine, and those swine ran violently down the hill into the ocean, and they're drowned in Mark chapter 5. When we think about biblical exorcism, one of the things we realize is this was an event that occurred in the first century, but not everybody could do it. Some couldn't cast out demons. The seven sons of Sceva, Acts chapter 19, verse 13, they tried it, and they were left hurt and naked in that situation. Jesus gave that power to His followers in the New Testament. Matthew 10 verse 8, when He sent out His workers, He gave certain ones the power as well to cast out demons. And yet, even though they had that power, Jesus spoke to them in Matthew 17 21. When they wondered why they couldn't cast out one, Jesus taught them some demons were indeed harder to get out. Now the burning question, do demons exist today? Do, do I need to, and do you need to live in fear of demon possession? Do I need to sit home at night and get myself all into a tizzy and worry that some demon is going to come and possess my body and live within me? Friend, the good news is this. The Bible clearly and abundantly teaches demon possession. All demon possession has ended. Demons are no longer a threat to you. You can be sure that that is not going to occur to you. How can we be sure? Because the Bible explicitly and emphatically teaches that was a first century phenomenon. Now, let me show you the passage. I want you to notice in your Bible, Zechariah, the old minor prophet, Old Testament minor prophet, Zechariah, and I want you to look beginning in Zechariah 13, beginning in verse 1. Let's notice the context of Zechariah 13, beginning in verse number 1. In that day, now if I can find the day, that helps me a lot. In that day, a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanliness. Well, no doubt, this is a prophetic statement about the New Testament age, about that, that fountain being open for sin and cleanliness, uh, uncleanliness, John 19, 34, when they pierced the side of Jesus, forthwith came blood and water. What is this time period? It's the time period of the sacrifice, death, and offering of Jesus for sin. So we're talking about the first century. Now, let's follow with the context and see. Verse 2, It shall be in that day, same time frame, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of idols from the land. They shall no longer be remembered. I will also cause the prophets, watch this now, and the unclean spirit to depart from the land. During the time of Christ, during the time of the first century, Here's what's going to happen. There was going to be that fountain opened. Acts chapter 2, Peter stands up with the eleven. They proclaim the sacrifice, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Men and women respond to that. And for the very first time, they are told, repent and be baptized. Watch this. For the forgiveness of sins. And so that fountain was open. Now, what else was going to happen during that time frame? 
Idols were cut off from the land. History records that after the Babylonian exile, after the exiles, Jews no longer worshipped idols. Prophets were going to be cut off. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 through 10, prophecy, miraculous knowledge, and the miracles were going to cease. But now notice this. And the unclean spirits will depart from the land. Friend, what do I know about demon possession? Here's what I learned from Zechariah 13 and what a comfort it is. Demon possession was only a first century phenomenon to show the power of Christ, who He was, what He could do, and that He was greater than Satan and all the demons, and that during the first century, the Bible says unclean spirits, which a demon and unclean spirits is the same thing, were going to depart from the land. And so the Bible showed Christ's power through demons. And the Bible prophesied that demons and demon possession would come to an end. And so here are the conclusions that we can draw today. This was simply a New Testament event. They existed to show Christ's power over Satan and his greatest workers. And Jesus himself was the master exorcist and had power over all demons. And demon possession has ended today. Friend, I, I don't sit at home because of what the Bible teaches. I don't sit at home and worry and wonder if some demon is going to possess me. I don't attribute things that might happen today to demons simply because the Bible says they were going to depart during the first century. And so we hope that this study has been encouraging, helpful, gaining both knowledge and confidence in Christ. Now, here's the main lesson we take away. Satan's greatest work workers did much harm in the New Testament. But friends, Jesus triumphed over every one of them. Jesus is greater than Satan, and the Bible says, He who is in you, Christ, is greater than he who is in the world. Let's put our trust in the Bible. Let's put our trust in Jesus, and let's know that ultimately, if I'm faithful to Christ on that last day, we will have the victory. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost again, souls, not your walk. Like we encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. And to God be the glory, and to God be the glory, this is the gospel of Christ.